Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 21 Relief of the Souls After the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we have a multitude of secondary, though most efficacious, means of relieving the holy souls, if we employ them with spirit, faith, and fervor. In the first place comes prayer, prayer in all its forms. The annals of the seraphic order speak with admiration of Brother Corrado de Ophidia, one of the first companions of St. Francis. He was distinguished by a spirit of prayer and charity which contributed great to the edification of his brethren. Among the latter, there was a young monk whose relaxed and disorderly conduct disturbed the holy community. But thanks to the prayers and charitable exhortations of Corrado, he entirely corrected himself and became a model of regularity. Soon after this happy conversion, he died, and his brethren gave him the ordinary suffrages. A few days elapsed, when Brother Corrado, being in prayer before the altar, heard a voice asking the assistance of his prayers. Who are you? said the servant of God. I am, replied the voice, the soul of the young religious, whom you reanimated to fervor. But you did not die a holy death? Are you still in great need of prayers? I died a good death, and I am saved, but on account of my former sins, which I had not the time to expiate, I suffer the most terrible chastisement, and I beseech you not to refuse me the assistance of your prayers. Immediately the good brother prostrated himself between the tabernacle and recited the pater, followed by the requiem eternum. O oh, my good father, cried the apparition, what refreshment your prayers procure for me! O oh, how it relieves me! I entreat you to continue. Corrado devoutly repeated the same prayers, Beloved Father, again repeated the soul. Still more, still more, I experience such great relief when you pray. The charitable religious continued his prayers with renewed fervor and repeated the Our Father a hundred times. Then, in accents of unspeakable joy, the deceased soul said to him, I thank you, my dear Father, in the name of God, I am delivered. Behold, I am about to enter the kingdom of heaven. We see by the preceding example how efficacious are but the smallest prayers, the shortest supplications, to alleviate the sufferings of the poor souls. I have read, says Father Rossingioli, that a bishop wrapped in ecstasy saw a child who with a golden fish hook and a silver thread drew forth from the bottom of a well a woman who had been drowned therein. After this prayer, and whilst on the way to the church, he saw the same child praying at a grave in the cemetery. What are you doing there, my little friend? he asked. I am saying the Our Father and Hail Mary, answered the child, for the soul of my mother, whose body lies buried here. The prelate immediately understood that God had wished to show him the efficacy of the most simple prayer. He knew that the soul of that woman had been delivered, that the fishhook was the potter, and that Ave was the silver thread of that mystic line. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 22 Relief of the Holy Souls, the Holy Rosary we know that the Holy Rosary holds the first place amongst all the prayers which the Church recommends to the faithful. This excellent prayer, the source of so many graces for the living, is also singularly efficacious in relieving the dead. Of this we have a touching proof of the life of Father Nuremberg, whom we have mentioned elsewhere. This charitable servant of God imposed upon himself frequent mortifications accompanied by devotions and prayers for the relief of the poor suffering souls. He never omitted to recite the rosary each day for their intention, and gained for them all the indulgences in his power, an offering which he recommended to the faithful in a special work for which he published on the subject. The chaplet which he used was ornamented with pious medals and enriched with numerous indulgences. It happened one day that he lost it, and he was inconsolable, 
not that this holy religious, whose heart was not fettered by anything on earth, had any material attachment to these beads, but because he saw himself deprived of the means of procuring the relief he was accustomed to give to the poor souls. He sought everywhere, tried to recollect where he could have put his precious treasure. All was useless, and when evening came, he found himself obliged to replace his indulgent chaplet by ordinary prayers. While thus engaged and alone in his cell, he heard a noise in the ceiling like that of his beads, which was well known to him, and raised his eyes. He saw in reality his chaplet, held by an invisible hand, descending towards him and fall at his feet. He did not doubt that the invisible hands were those of the souls who were relieved by this means. We can imagine with what renewed fervor he recited his accustomed five decades, and how much this wonder encouraged him to persevere in a practice so visibly approved by heaven. Venerable Mother Francis of the Blessed Sacrament had from her infancy the greatest devotion towards the suffering souls, and preserved therein as long as she lived. She was all heart, all devotion towards those poor holy souls. To assist them she recited her rosary, which she was accustomed to call her almoner, and she ended each decade with a requisite and prace. On feast days, when she had more free time, she had the office of the dead. To prayer she joined penances. The greater part of the year she fasted on bread and water, and so on vigils she practiced other austerities. She had to endure much labor and fatigue, pain and persecution. All these works were turned into profit for the holy souls. Francis offered all to God for their relief. Not content with assisting them herself as far as was in her power, she engaged others to do the same. If priests came to the convent, she begged for masses for them. If they were laymen, she advised them to distribute abundant alms for the faithful departed. In recompense for her charity, God frequently permitted the souls to visit her, either to solicit her sufferings or to return her thanks. Witnesses have testified that several times they visibly waited for her by the door when she was going to office of matins that they might recommend themselves to her prayers. At other times they entered into her cell in order to present the request to her. They surrounded her bed, waiting for her to wake. These apparitions to which she was accustomed caused no fear, and that she might not think herself to be sport of a dream or a dupe of the devil, they said on entering, Hail, servant of God, spouse of the Lord, may Jesus Christ be ever with you. Then they testified their veneration for a large cross and the relics of the saints, which their benefactress kept in her cell. If they found her reciting the rosary, add the same witnesses, they took her hands and kissed them lovingly as the instruments of their deliverance. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 23 Relief of the Holy Souls Fast penances, and mortifications. After prayer comes fasting, that is to say, not only fasting properly so-called, which consists in abstaining from food, but also all penitential works of what nature soever they may be. It must be here remarked that this is a question not only of the greatest austerities practiced by the saints, but also of tribulations, all the contradictions of this life, as also the least mortifications, the smallest sacrifices which we impose upon ourselves or accept for the love of God, and which we offer to the divine mercy for the relief of the holy souls. A glass of water which we refuse ourselves when thirsty is a trifling thing, and if we consider this act in itself, we can scarcely see the efficacy it possesses to alleviate the sufferings of purgatory. But such is the divine goodness that it designs to accept this as a sacrifice of great value. If I am permitted, says the Abbe Levé, speaking of this subject, I will relate an example which come almost under my own personal experience. 
One of my relations was a religious in the community which she edified, not by the heroism of virtue which shone forth in the saints, but by an ordinary virtue and great regularity of life. It happened that she lost a friend whom she had formerly known in this world, and from the time she heard of her death, she made it her duty to recommend her to God. One evening, being very thirsty, her first impulse was to refresh herself with a glass of water, this being allowed by her rule. But she remembered her deceased friend, and, for the benefit of her soul, refused herself this little gratification. Instead, then, of drinking this glass of water which she held in her hand, she poured it out, praying to God to show mercy to the departed. This good sister reminds us of King David, who, finding himself with his army in a place without water and oppressed with thirst, refused to drink the refreshing water which was brought to him from the cisterns of Bethlehem. Instead of raising it to his parched lips, he poured it out as a libation to the Lord, and Holy Scripture cites this act of the Holy King as one of the most agreeable to God. Now this slight mortification, which our holy religious imposed upon herself in denying herself this draught of water, was so pleasing to God that he permitted the departed soul to make it manifest by an apparition. On the following night she appeared to the sister, heartily thanking her for the relief she had received. Those few drops of water, which in the spirit of mortification she had denied herself, were changed into a refreshing bath to temper the heat of the purgatorial fires. We wish here to remark that we here say is not restricted to acts of supergatory mortification. It must be understood of obligatory mortification. That is to say, of all that we have to undergo in the fulfillment of our duties, and in general, to all the good works to which our duties as Christians or those of particular state of life oblige us. Thus, every Christian is bound by virtue of the law of God to refrain from wanton words, slander, and murmuring. Thus, every religious must observe silence, charity, and obedience as prescribed by the rule. Now these observances, though of obligation, when practiced in the true spirit of a Christian, with a view to please God in union with the labors and sufferings of Jesus Christ, may become suffrages to serve and relieve the holy souls. In that famous apparition where Blessed Margaret Mary saw the deceased religious suffering intensely for her tepidity, the poor soul, after having related in detail the torments which she endured, concluded with these words, Alas, one hour exactitude in silence, could cure my parched mouth. Another passed in the practice of charity would heal my tongue. Another passed without murmuring or disappropriations by the action of the superior would cure my tortured heart. By this we see that the soul asks not for works of supergregation, but only the application of those of which religious are obliged. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 24 Relief of the Holy Souls, Holy Communion If ordinary good works procure so much relief for the souls, what will not the effects of the holiest work a Christian can accomplish? I mean, Holy Communion. When St. Magdalene de Pazzi saw her brother in the sufferings of purgatory, touched with compassion, she melted into tears and cried in a lamentable voice, O oh, afflicted soul, how terrible are your pains! Why are they not understood by those who lack the courage to carry their cross here below? Whilst well, you were still in the world, my dear brother, you would have not listen to me, and now you desire so ardently that I should hear you. Poor victim! What do you require of me? Here she stopped and was heard to count up to the number of one hundred and seven. Then she said aloud that this was the number of the communions, which he begged in tone of supplication. Yes, she said to him, I can easily do what you ask, but alas, what a length of time it will take me to pay that debt. 
Oh, if God permitted, how willingly would I go there where you are, to deliver you, or to prevent others from descending into it? The saint, without emitting her prayers and other suffrages, made with the greatest fervor all the communions which her brother desired for his deliverance. It is, says Father Rossangioli, a pious custom established in the churches of the Society of Jesus to offer each month a general communion for the benefit of the souls in purgatory, and God has designed to show by a prodigy how agreeable this practice is to him. In the year 1615, when the Fathers of Rome celebrated this monthly communion in the Church of Our Lady in Traverste, a crowd of persons was present. Among the fervent Christians, there was one great sinner, who although taking part in the pious ceremonies of religion, had for a long time led a very wicked life. This man, before entering the church, saw coming out and advancing toward him a man of humble appearance, who asked of him an alms for the love of God. He at first refused, but the poor man, as is customary with beggars, persisted, asking a third time in a most pitiful tone of supplication. Finally, yielding to the good inspiration, our sinner recalled the mendicant and gave him a piece of money. Then the poor man changed his entreaties into other language. Keep your money, he said. I stand in no need of your liberality, but you yourself greatly need to make a change in your life. Know that it was to give you this solitary warning that I come to Mount Gargano to the ceremony which was to take place in this church today. It is now twenty years since you have been leading this deplorable life, provoking the anger of God instead of appeasing it by a sincere confession. Hasten to penance if you would escape the strokes of divine justice ready to fall upon your head. The sinner was struck by these words. A secret fear took possession of him when he heard the secrets of conscience revealed, when he thought they were known to God alone. His emotion increased when he saw the poor man vanish like smoke before his eyes. Opening his heart to grace, he entered the church, cast himself upon his knees, and shed a torrent of tears. Then sincerely repented, he sought a confessor, made an avowal of his crimes, and asked pardon. After confession, he related to the priest what had happened to him, begging him to make it known in order that the devotion towards the holy souls might be increased. For he had no doubt that it was a soul just delivered that he obtained for him the grace of conversion. It may be here asked, who is that mysterious medicine that appeared to the sinner in order to convert him? Some have believed that it was none other than the archangel Michael, but he said that he came from Mount Gargano. We know that this mountain is celebrated throughout Italy for an apparition of St. Michael, in whose honor a magnificent shrine has been erected. However this may be, the conversion of the sinner by such a miracle, and at the same moment when prayers and holy communion are being offered for the faithful departed, shows plainly the excellence of this devotion and how pleasing it must be in the sight of God. Let us therefore conclude in the words of St. Bernard. May charity lead you to communicate, for there is nothing more efficacious for the eternal repose of the dead.